Being indigenous and in making art means that you're looking at the world through lenses that are curved or changed by your upbringing and by your worldview. I'm David Velasco. I'm the editor-in-chief of Art Forum magazine, and I'm here today with the co-curators of Signals, How Video Transformed the World at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Michelle Quo and Stuart Comer. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, David. So our main issue is um, called The Screen Image, and it's dedicated to video as a media. And of course, uh, it's one of the big ties is your exhibition here as the Museum of Modern Art that is titled differently. You're not focused on screens in the title, you're focused on signals. And I was curious actually why you used the word signals to uh, talk about video as a medium. I think for us it was really important to think about video not as a medium with a coherent set um, or stable set of protocols and materials, um, nor as something that was about strictly the image or the documentary reference. Really, um, for many artists, video became important as something that could be sent and transmitted and that was part of a network infrastructure. And that meant sometimes that changing the signal, distorting the signal, breaking up the signal was just as important as whatever the signal represented, whether that was an image feed or um, reportage or evidence. Um, and so that's why for us, signals became this key, um, key node and you see them <laughs> in some way, maybe you feel them flowing throughout the show. And similarly, they take multiple forms. So to just define it in terms of the screen felt very limiting. And in a sense, it's a very sculptural show. And a lot of artists, Dara Birnbaum, for instance, was actually the first woman to study architecture at Carnegie Mellon, and that background has informed her work for decades. So she's always been interested in the apparatus. So the way that um, literally the public sphere has been constructed both through video, but also um, you know, through these kind of public media forms was really important for us to highlight in the exhibition design as well. And we hope, you know, provides this sense that, you know, the, the signal, as Michelle said, is not limited to an image, but really it, it is the conduit for an entire network of situations, systems, people. That's why we claim that it has transformed the world, because in a sense it really has, but on terms that art conventionally did not do. You're situated, like, from the beginning. You know, you have Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinovitz's um, hole in space, like next to or across from, I suppose, Tiffany Shaw's Never Rest, Unrest, you know, work separated by 40 years. And I'm curious, yeah, just how you decided, maybe we could start there, how you decided to start with these two uh, works. Both had been on the checklist pretty much from very early on. I think we acquired Never Rest, Unrest probably a few years into the planning process, but we knew immediately that it needed to be in the show. And then Hole in Space was always towards the front of the show, but then suddenly it became very clear that these were critical bookends to consider. And that, you know, through both of them, you really see not only just how the technology has changed, but how the crowd specifically and its relationship to being filmed or to the camera and to where that camera or that screen even exists has fundamentally shifted. And so with Hole in Space, for the first time, you have this satellite feed connecting a crowd in Lincoln Center in New York to a crowd in a shopping mall in Culver City in Los Angeles. And of course, it is a shock because people encountered these in public space a Hole in Space also was referred to by the artist as a telecommunications sculpture. So this idea of some sort of sculpture that is connecting these two coasts in this surreal way um, is completely fascinating. And I think it's also important to note that you get this kind of euphoria, this joy <laughs> um, that people uh, erupt into when they see each other um, in that work. But then at the same time, Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinovitz 
really thought of Whole in Space also as a critical work, as an alternative to um, a kind of mass media infrastructure that they wanted to combat, that they wanted to confront. So it's not just that this is a purely utopian kind of wishful thinking, it's that they're saying the existing system, there's something wrong with it, and we want to propose um, something else. And then you see Tiffany's work, which has the aspect ratio of the iPhone, and then set in uh, against a window, actually, at MoMA, so you see scenes of Hong Kong playing out against the background of Midtown Manhattan um, uncannily uh, behind it. But you understand that um, much of what Tiffany is showing or recording on her phone as she's embedded in the Hong Kong protests of 2019 um, is the protesters themselves trying to communicate with one another, trying to galvanize themselves, trying to figure out where, where should they meet, what kind of supplies do they need. So in this different age, um, decades later, of social media, where suddenly um, video and the phone become a conduit for um, gathering and for insurrection, it actually is um, a, a continuation in many ways of the kinds of models that Whole in Space um, was proposing. When I saw the show, um, the, one of the, of course, one of the first things you really notice that stands out is Stan Van Der Beek's uh, movie drone, which is this giant, uh, you know, the top of a grain silo that has been repurposed for projection of all these different kinds of images. And I remember you actually saying that it's not the original, uh, <laughs> and you actually had to find a way to recast it for this exhibition. I'm curious if you could talk about bringing it in, why it's there, how you how you made it. Uh, work in the exhibition space. So it's been a very long-term ambition, both to acquire this work and to finally reconstruct it properly. And there have been different attempts over the years to do that. Uh, the Whitney actually did also his movie Mural, which is also an incredible piece and relate, very related to the movie drone. Um, but it has never been reproduced to scale. Um, and we worked very closely with the estate and Sarah Vanderbeek uh, and Chelsea Spengerman in particular. And Stan had actually deposited a lot of his films, collages, and other material at the museum, I believe in the 70s. Um, it was never formally accessioned, but we have been custodians of this material for a very, very long time. And so working, again, with the estate um, and our media contributors and our film team, we restored all the films, and there were certain things that are now basically obsolete, so um, 70 millimeter slides, for instance. So those were digitized. But Stan's original ambition was to have as many kinds of projection as possible. And it's important to stress, actually this work is not video. It predates the port pack camera. But it was seen as one of a number of satellites that would communicate with each other globally uh, through a, an image database specifically. So the whole idea is that this was a pictorial language of communication through a kind of memory bank, which is basically YouTube, you know, but done in 19, the mid-1960s. But cooler. And much cooler. <laughs> So, um, but we learned that the, actually the original company that had fabricated the grain silo still exists in rural Pennsylvania. So they built this for us. Uh, it is basically the exact scale as the original. I think Vanderbeek was really anticipating the flood of waves that were already or would surround us all. Like we um, are all surrounded by these waves and signals right now as we're sitting here. And as David Tudor once said, you just need to actually um, put up an antenna to listen. So this idea of a kind of sensory awareness or like sensing uh, being um, already having to adapt to not only the immersive conditions of a dome-like structure like the movie drone, but then just like the world around us, that's something that the movie drone enacts um, for us in some sort of microcosmic way. I think one of the joys of the show for me is how many names I didn't actually know. You know, coming into MoMA, looking at a video show, you could have expected it to be very canonical. You could have expected, you know, to hit, you know, certain kinds of figures that I know of as, you know, the video artists, you know, Arthur Jaffa or Peter Sterl, who are incredible artists, but who didn't make their way into the show in this way. Helen, you know, I, Tina Rivers Ryan in her review talks about how this isn't a comprehensive history of video artists, more of a strategic archaeology, she says. And I was curious, um, you know, when you were approaching it, did you have a moment when you thought, 
oh, we should do greatest hits? Or were you, did, did you begin thinking, we want to be very expansive about the, the kinds of groups you're including here? Well, first of all, this is a collection show. So the majority, the vast majority of the works are from the MoMA collection. So that's already um, incredibly vast, but still um, circumscribed set of works. And then we wanted to really pull out a thread from that. So this is, it's impossible to do a comprehensive survey of video anyway. So we wanted to really tease out um, what we thought were some really important threads. And that, of course, became um, this idea of video relating to a public, to social change, and to artists who were interested in um, changing what they perceived as a top-down, one-way form of communication or transmission from mass media to a multi-way um, conversation or network around the world. Um, and I think part of the um, the thread there really then leads you into all of these names that may not be um, as well known who were um, part of this democratization of tools and access to tools, um, but also part of uh, what some called guerrilla TV, um, insurrectionist kinds of movements, people who were thinking about um, video and art as a way to, to really change um, society. If you could change perception and change communication, could you also change um, the world? And I think, I mean, to your point about artists like Arthur J. Poe or Hito Steirel, both of whom have appeared in our galleries and, you know, we are actively championing in our collection and beyond. But that said, like, the art world has not been great about providing a context for that work. And they're not alone. There is an incredible history there. And that's what we're trying to highlight in many ways. And there are kind of, maybe to overgeneralize, kind of three categories that you often see in major video surveys. It's either about the cinematic, or it's about immersion, or it is about television. And even though television is certainly a factor in this show, um, you know, it's not reducible again to just really that. It's much more about a, a set of global telecommunication technologies in which television played a key role, but the satellite was used by artists well beyond television broadcast. Um, we really wanted to move the show beyond the kind of standard argument about cinema, which is still crucially important, but many shows have tackled that very well, and we feel it's pretty well-established territory at this point. So we wanted to try to do something different that was closer to what artists were really trying to do in the early 70s. And, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, you had a lot of artists, you know, from the Dishtal movement to the Bauhaus and beyond, all arguing for cinema to find its own terms, to distance itself more and more from theater and literature. And in many ways, video artists had to then further distance themselves from cinema as well and say, actually, this is something different. So we wanted to present it on those terms to some extent and, and try to help define what those terms, you know, could be so that there is a kind of lexicon for the public to better understand artists like Kito Steirel or Arthur J. Fez as they come along. Um, obviously, we could have had four more floors, you know, and filled them we tried. very happily. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, to your point, this is not Video Art 101. It is not an all, a completely comprehensive survey of the medium. It's a very surgical slice of one way of thinking about it. But I think, too, that um, when you think about some of the earlier works in the show, there is this idea that, you know, if you could only send signals, if you could only connect and um, have a true communication happen, you might change things for the better. You might um, introduce a kind of electronic democracy, which is the word that Namjoon Paik and John Cage used, or the phrase that used. Um, but then you also get this creeping sense all alongside that actually, even if you just connect, um, all sorts of other things may happen. And we've seen authoritarian forces decide that instead of just sending signals or messages or propaganda, they're going to drown everything out with noise. And that's actually the tactic. Um, so there are all of these new uh, landscapes of information that we're dealing with. And this is part of what we hope the show does is also um, help get us used to thinking about these histories and ideas critically and um, understand some of the dynamics that are at play that we may take for granted or just like not even notice. Our main cover is of course, uh, Sandra Perry's double, quadruple, et cetera, et cetera, one and two, which is a work from 2013. You know, I when I first saw it, The Kitchen, I believe, and I thought this is an incredible work. It's, you know, it stuck with me in this way that when I saw it here in your show, I was like, this is of course one of the great works of the last decade. Um, I'm really glad to see it here. I was wondering if you could actually talk about 
the work and why you included it in the show. So Sandra is an incredible artist um, whose work has been in the collection in Stewart's department for some time, but this seemed to be an opportunity to show this work, first of all, as um, a kind of installation of in not just two video channels, but actually two projections that um, could be arrayed architecturally in space, where the architecture of the space actually reflects or echoes the architecture that's in the video itself. Um, the video video shows two essentially corners where Sandra is um, filming two performers, two different perf performers, whipping their bodies around and dancing. She's using basic Photoshop tools, um, specifically the content aware fill function, um, to kind of erase their bodies. She's actually taking elements of the background, for those of you who know how to use the clone stamp, uh, you would take elements of the background and just kind of um, uh, stamping out the bodies of these performers. So you get um, their uh, sort of dazzling evanescence. They seem to flash, but they also seem to disappear into the space. But the thing that is left intact is their hair. Their hair is whipping around. And so Sandra is really, um, I think the work is is examining um, questions of black subjectivity, but more generally this question of, you know, in an age where we are all on camera now all the time, what would it mean to actually exempt yourself um, from the equation, to kind of disappear, um, to erase yourself? And again, you've seen so many artists in the show that um, are thinking about visibility and liveness and connection. And so it becomes very powerful toward the end of the exhibition to see um, an artist asking the question, well, in this day and age, you know, what if you simply want to um, disappear? There's another work in the show by an American artist that looks specifically at predictive policing software that effectively criminalizes entire neighborhoods even in the absence of a crime. And so it really suggests a more sinister aspect of the technology, of course. And, you know, again, this question of racial surveillance um, and just the degree to which the camera is now calling the shots in pretty terrifying ways. And I think the way that Sandra is not addressing exactly the same question, but nonetheless finding a space of agency, which is what the artists throughout the show are doing, in fact, is like trying to use video, um, not as a weapon specifically, but just as a form of agency. And uh, so whether that is a form of liberation or disappearance or somehow just even coping you know, with this deluge of, of images and signals, um, it just seems like a really powerful work to close the show with. Thank you for inviting us to do it in the museum proper and also in the, the media uh, conservation lab. Um, where we can see that the signals actually, of course, have a material substrate at all times. It's an incredible show, and I hope that everybody gets the chance to see it. Thank, Thank you, you so much, David. Thank, Thank you. you.